An artist can illustrate a human figure using just a few strokes of the brush. How is it that the artist knows that you will interpret that human figure correctly? That's what we're going to investigate today. The human artist creates an impression of the human figure and then the human viewer interprets that as a human figure. What's going on inside the artist's head and what's going on inside the viewer's head? And can we work out what's going on so that we can emulate what the artist is doing in a computer? We're going to look at three different genres, impressionist and post-impressionist painting, then the illustrations in children's picture books, then cross-stitch and how cross-stitch has inspired pixel art. In this painting by Monet, there's a small figure in green on the left-hand side. But if you look closely, that figure in green is just a blob of green paint with a blob of pink paint on top. There are no facial features whatsoever, and yet, from a distance, you easily interpreted this as a human being, perhaps wrapped in a cloak. So let's look at three further examples of this sort of abstraction. In this painting by Gauguin, there are four figures. If we zoom close in, the tall figure on the left is clearly a Roman Catholic priest. You can tell that because of the hat, the beard and the long cloak. The other figures are children, but to understand that, you need to understand the context of the painting and the times in which it was drawn. In this painting by Monk, there are two figures, one in yellow and one in white, and they are clearly dancing on the beach. We understand that from the title of the painting. We can also understand that these are two young women, that they are twirling round each other. That's evident by the fact that they're unbalanced, they're holding hands and their hair is flying out. You can tell they're young women by the long hair and by the dresses that they are wearing. You've interpreted all of that from what is essentially a blob of red paint on top of a blob of yellow paint and a blob of yellow paint on top of a blob of white paint. In Seurat's painting of bathers, we can tell a lot about the figures here. Looking at this young man, we can tell he's a young man, even though he is just some pink blobs with a brown blob on top. You can even see that his right arm is on his hip and his right leg is thrust forward. So having seen those examples, let's now look at some examples of extreme abstraction. Here we have a painting by Renoir of a little crowd. And if you look in the background, you will see that these are blobs of white paint with a little blob of pink or brown paint. But you interpret these as people sitting or standing on the hillside. This painting by Monet, you see four figures in two boats. If we zoom in on them, there's almost no detail. These are just little blobs of black paint. And yet you easily interpret them as four people in two boats. And in this painting by Sisley, in the far distance, there are five little blobs of pink paint on a blue field. And you interpret that as five people bathing in the river. And that's not just people. We can also do this with other objects, and Monet was really good at this. This is one of Monet's water lilies. And it is in fact just a collection of about 20 strokes of paint. And yet he's got so good at representing water lilies that you can interpret this as a water lily. So let's look at a real photograph of a water lily and see what happens if you try to do the same thing in Photoshop. So Photoshop gives you a range of abstractions and these are different abstractions that you can get in Photoshop. And they're all very pretty and artistic in their own ways, but not one of them gets anywhere near the abstraction level that Monet achieves with his strokes of paint. So what we can currently do with the basic tools in Photoshop is nothing like what Monet was doing. Now, it's not just the Impressionists who did this. There's pre-Impressionist work, there's post-Impressionist work, and let's also look at some animals. So this is a painting long before Impressionism by Caroline Abraham. You have five people on a raft. If you look at those five people, they're just blobs of paint. So this idea of abstraction predates Impressionism. Then let's look later than Impressionism. Lowry is in some sense an Impressionist and he populates his cities 
with these impressionist ideas of human figures. And they're very abstracted human figures, but you can still work out that that's a man posting letters in a post box with a dog beside him. Now consider an example of two human figures where cultural knowledge helps with identification, even with extreme abstraction. Cervantes' 17th century Spanish novel Don Quixote has spawned many depictions of its main character, the knight Don Quixote, and his faithful sidekick Sancho Panza. Dormier's 1850 rendition on the left shows a typical depiction of the knight on horseback with a shield, lance and hat. This stereotype has become so well known that Monroe's 2009 sketch on the right is recognisable to anybody with the appropriate cultural knowledge. The most eminent abstraction of Don Quixote is that of Picasso in the middle. And Picasso was exceptional in making brilliant art with a minimum of detail. I want you to draw your attention to the figure of Sancho Panza in Dormier's painting on the left, because it's nothing more than a grey blob. There are no details other than the silhouette. Despite having only a silhouette to work with, anyone who has identified Don Quixote will see in this grey blob a fat man in a shapeless coat and hat riding a donkey, because those are the defining visual characteristics of Panza. However, I asked a teenager who'd never come across the story what she saw, and she identified the silhouette as an elderly lady carrying two shopping bags. And that shows the importance of contextual knowledge. Other examples of contextual knowledge come here in Pissarro's picture of a bucolic scene, in which those cows in the field are really very vague cows. And then this picture from 2002, which Mulvey calls cows grazing Grasmere. Everyone I've shown this picture to says that these are sheep, not cows. If we zoom in, they're actually just blobs. They can be whatever you want them to be. We now move on to look at children's picture books. I believe these are a fantastic source for inspiration about how abstraction is achieved. And I have two reasons for that. First, a children's book illustrator will have to paint the same characters many times in a book, possibly at different scales. So that gives you examples of how a human artist achieves this feat. And secondly, all the commentators on children's picture books agree that picture books provide training in how to understand abstraction and aesthetics. One of the best examples of abstraction in a children's book is in Dashing Dog, illustrated by the brilliant Sarah Garland. In the story, the principal characters are a family of five and a dog. Garland painted 25 separate illustrations for the book. The most interesting abstractions occur in the book's climax, where the toddler in the family falls off a pier into the water and is rescued by the dog. This is illustrated in four panels, rendered by Garland in the minimum of detail. In this, the human figures are less than 10 millimeters high and clearly demonstrate the limitations of watercolor as a rendering medium. If we look at them in close up, you can see that the red-headed girl is now just a few blobs of colored paint. Her jacket is reduced to two stripes. The other three members of the family are rendered in an equally sparse way. Yet having followed these characters through six previous paintings, the reader can easily identify who is who from the colour of their clothing and their hair. More than that, the reader can also identify what they're doing and something of what they're feeling. And remember, this book is aimed at children aged four to seven, which indicates that humans have developed the ability to understand illustrative abstraction by that age. We see also here, if we look at the red-headed girl again, that her jacket has a different number of stripes depending on the resolution it's been drawn at. We don't care that there are a different number of stripes. All we care about is that it is a stripy jacket. And we can't talk about children's picture books without talking about Beatrix Potter. These are eight paintings from The Tale of Mrs. Tiggywinkle. And you have Tiggywinkle at different sizes. But if you look at the little girl, you'll see that Potter has chosen to paint the little girl at pretty much the same size in every painting. 
Tiggy Winkle varies in size a little more. If you look at that, you'll see it really is true. The little girl is pretty much painted at the same size and Tiggy Winkle only varies in size by about a factor of two to one. So what are the ranges of size in children's picture books? Are these really a good way of working out how artists do abstraction? Well, we looked at a range of children's picture books. These show the ranges of sizes of a character in each of the books. They range from the minimum size to the maximum size, and the box shows you the interquartile range. So over on the left, we have Humber in the book Mummy and Me. The artist there has chosen to draw the character Humber at exactly the same size in every single picture. For Tiggy Winkle, we see here that the minimum size is 21 millimeters, the maximum size is about 50 millimeters, and therefore Tiggy Winkle's range of sizes is just a little over two to one. The red-headed girl in Dashing Dog, we saw her minimum size earlier, it was eight millimeters high, and at her biggest, she's about 150 millimeters high. So in that case, we have an example of a character where the artist has chosen to draw the figure in a range of different sizes. But if you look at the size of the interquartile box, this box here, you'll see that most artists choose to keep the character pretty tight to the same size with only a few versions bigger or smaller than the normal size for that character. In Tiggy Winkle, these are Mrs. Tiggy Winkle at her biggest and smallest. And you can see the gorgeous detail in the left-hand image. And on the right-hand image, you can see what Potter's had to do to abstract away that detail. For example, there are far fewer prickles poking through the bonnet. Now, not all artists do abstract away the detail. In the Stripey Horse books, illustrated by Karen Wall, Stripey Horse appears in various different sizes and always has the same number of stripes in the same order. So Karen Wall chose not to abstract away the detail, but you can see that because she's done that, the largest version of Stripey Horse appears to have limited detail for its size, and the smallest version has lots of detail for its size. Let's now move on to talk about cross-stitch and how that's influenced pixel art and computer graphics. Cross-stitch is essentially pixel art from way before there were computers. There's a limited resolution because you could only get down to the resolution of a single stitch. For example, these two deer, you can tell they're deer, they have antlers. Their front feet are not hitting the ground, there's not a lot of detail, but you can tell what sort of animal they are. In this particular cross stitch, there's also this animal, we're not quite sure what it is, possibly a squirrel. This idea of limited resolution was carried over into the early video games. On the left, you see the cover art from the game Lemmings. On the right, you see what the Lemmings actually looked like in the game. And there were little animation sequences. And you can see his hair's flopping and he's walking forward, even though there is a tiny, tiny number of pixels to make this work. There's been work done in the field of computer graphics to try to automate this abstraction. And here is an example from a 2013 paper of what you can achieve. It's recognizable as the person in the photograph, but it's not great. By contrast, this is a kit that you can buy from a cross-stitch store where you can illustrate your own family. And you can identify the people here if you know the family. You can even tell that dad's carrying a baby in a baby carrier, and you can probably identify what breed of dog they have. Indeed, you can buy cross-stitch patterns that show you how to represent your dog in a small number of stitches, no matter what breed it is. And here we see the evolution of Mario, starting from pixelated on the left to beautifully rendered 3D on the right. Now, each of these was generated by a human artist. The challenge we're trying to think about is how would you take the picture on the right, the beautiful, heavily detailed model, and from it automatically generate the picture on the left? We have no idea how to do that. So what have we learned from all these examples? 
Well, first we've learned that you have to be consistent in how you draw these. The characters have to be recognizable to other human beings. Secondly, we've seen that the medium drives what detail is possible. Beatrix Potter had to abstract away Tiggy Winkle because she was using watercolor. The third point is that the abstractions depend on human knowledge. We knew that that was a priest in that early example because of human knowledge. We know what a dog looks like, we know what a deer looks like, and the abstraction depends on that. Then there's the fact that textural detail can change dramatically with scale. Stripy horse is the counter indication to this where we didn't change the textural detail, but Tiggy Winkle is, and the dashing dog examples even more so. And finally, this artistic depiction appears to be some sort of optimization problem. How do we optimize the stimulus that we are painting so it maximizes the response from the human being? And that leads to the question, what is the minimum stimulus that creates the desired interpretation? So in the final analysis, human beings are absolutely amazing at being able to interpret from a very sparse amount of detail and human artists are brilliant at being able to work out what the minimum amount of detail is to get the right response from the viewer. So what do you think? If you've got thoughts on how we could automate this abstraction, leave them in the comments. If you've got interesting observations from art that you've seen yourself, leave those too. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.